What's up folks, welcome to the part 6, of what if Deku become a healer hero, chapter 14. Finally, after what feels like the longest two weeks ever, the day of the sports festival arrives. Wow, this looks like so much fun. Izuku exclaims as he and Kaken walk into school. Despite it being early in the morning, is already packed. Vendors and booths line the walkways, selling fun foods and decorations. Music from the stadium can be heard all the way over. Can you, believe we're finally here, Kaken? Kaken grunts non-committally, eyeing the festivities disinterestedly. His mind is probably more focused on the trials to come, as is Yuku's should be. Still, he casts a longing look at a vendor selling bukoyaki as he follows his friend to the first year's stage. Aizawa already informed everyone of what to do before the festival begins. So they meet up with the rest of their classmates in the 1A waiting room. Hey, Bakugu kun, Midraya kun. Kirishima greets them, you guys excited? So excited. Izuku pumps his fists. I can't believe I'm actually here. Kaken and I always used to watch the sports festival on TV together. Zuku's just excited about the food, Kaken grunts, you should have seen him back there. He was practically drooling the entire way here. Hey! Izuku lightly slaps him on the shoulder while his friends laugh. He huffs and rolls his eyes. Well, anyway, I can't stay long. I have to meet up with Recovery Girl soon, he says, I hope I don't have to give you guys a lecture on staying safe. Kakan groans while everyone else shakes their heads. They're all wearing their training uniforms. Having changed right before going, to the waiting room, but Izuku is still wearing his regular uniform. It makes him feel just a little bit like an outsider, and a small twinge of envy tickles his chest they both watched the sports festival since they were kids, but Kaken's the one that gets to participate but he covers it up with a bright smile. He chats with his friends for a few minutes until Lita steps into the room, everyone, are you ready? He asks loudly, we will be entering soon. Oh, Midraya kun He tilts his head in confusion. Before Ida can ask what he's doing here, Izuku waves his hands apologetically. That's my cue. I guess I'll see you guys when this is all over. A volley of goodbyes shower him as he steps towards the door, but something makes him hesitate. He glances back at his classmates, Kaken, for once, is sitting quietly in a chair, eyes intense and focused. A few others like Tokoyami and Totoraki do the same, while the more excitable students try to chat away their nerves. Even though they've only been in there for a few weeks, they all look so much more confident than they used to. He knows how hard each and every one of them has been training for this day. Midraya-kun? Ida, asks, noticing him lingering, is everything alright? Is Yuku nods. He pauses, trying to find his words before looking up with what he hopes is an encouraging smile. There's no point in me telling you to do your best, because I know you're all going to do even more than that. So, I'll just say. Good luck everyone. I'll be cheering you on. They all stare at him for a few moments. Then all you, Midraya kun Thanks man. Holy shit, I might cry. Good luck to you too. With one last grin, Izuku turns around and starts jogging down the hallway. He's never been to the stadium's infirmary before, but Recovery Girl gave him a map of the first year's stage the other day, so it's easy enough to find. His mentor is bustling about inside, trying to prepare as best as she can for the busy day, ahead. Recovery Girl San. He greets, walking in, what do you need me to he's interrupted by his costume being thrown at his face. Put that on and go join your classmates, she says. Izuku blinks. Yeah. This wasn't part of the plan. But but they're going out soon. I know, and you're going to join them, recovery girl says, as if she hasn't just dropped a huge bomb on him. Come back here, once the first game starts. Izuku's mind is whirling. But but what? Hurry up and change. Startling. Izuku jumps into the other half of the room and pulls the curtain to give him some privacy. He changes in record speed, realizing that his healer costume is missing its gloves, 
elbow and knee pads so that he's just left with his green and white jumpsuit and belt, which doesn't carry his usual bags. It looks a bit more informal, like recovery girl's outfit that she wears while working rather than what he'd wear in the field. He doesn't have much time to dwell on it because soon he's racing back down the halls towards the waiting room. He nearly slams face first into Ida's chest as the door swings open. Midraya Kun. Ida exclaims, grabbing him by the shoulders to steady him. What's wrong? We're going out now. I know, is you could pants. Recovery girl San told me to join you. Huh? Murmurs of confusion ripple through his classmates. But but you're not in uniform. Ida sputters. Izuku shrugs cluelessly. I don't know, I'm as confused as you are. Present mixed voice zealously yells over the speaker and he winces. Let's go. Ida looks like he wants to protest the lack of order. Must be killing a goody two shoes like him but he just shakes his head and starts leading the way to the field. Izuku falls into step beside Kaken, who gives him a reassuring nod as they step into the entrance tunnel. It's time for the students to enter the first year stage. The miraculous new stars who overcame enemy attacks with their hearts of steel. Hero course, class 1A. The roar of the crowd is deafening. Fireworks pop and cameras flash from every angle as Izuku walks out onto the field with his classmates. He swallows heavily and glances around. He knew there would be a lot of people, but he never thought that he'd be one of the students under their eyes. Th there are so many people. He squeaks. Kirishima grins and nudges him. Man, present Mick is going overboard with that, praise. I'm getting nervous. Aren't you, Bakigutkan? He glances at the blonde. No. Kaken bears his teeth. I'm just getting more into it. Izuku lets out a nervous laugh. Easy there, Kaken. Class 1B gets announced after them, as well as the general studies, support course, and business course. They all gather together in front of a stage where midnight stands. She announces that it's time for the player's pledge and, to everyone's surprise, calls up Kakin to represent them. What? It's Kakin? Izuku glances at Kirishima and the Kaminari in confusion. Sero's head pops over his shoulder, startling him. I think it's cause he got first place in the entrance exam. Yeah, Kirishima says, apparently Midnight pulled him aside last week and told him to prepare a speech. Huh? Izuku's brow furrows. He didn't tell me anything. Kaminari snickers. He probably forgot about it. Kaken stands in front of the microphone with a neutral expression, hands in his pockets. Everyone waits with bated breath, then. I just wanna say. I'm gonna win. Izuku face palms. Kaken ignores the screeches and jeers from the crowd and walks back to stand beside Izuku. His expression doesn't change. Why are they booing? He grunts. I'm right. Izuku just sighs. You are hopeless, Bakugou Katsuki. Midnight is quick to call the attention back to her and announces that the first game will be an obstacle course race. As she begins to explain the rules, Izuku wonders when he should take his leave. It's not like he really has a reason for being here. He should be helping Recovery Girl, prepare. Why did she send him out here? In his costume, no less. He's garnering many curious looks from the other students, most of whom recognize him as Recovery Girl's apprentice. He tries his best to push down his growing anxiety, but the whispers behind him don't help. Midnight tells everyone to take their places around a nearby gate, which probably leads to the obstacle course. Izuku mentally, panics, wondering what he's supposed to be doing here. He ends up trailing behind the large group not wanting to get caught up in another stampede when the game begins. There are a couple of entrance tunnels sort of close to the gate, maybe he can start. Midnight yells. The next thing he knows, all the students are rushing forward and pouring into the gate, leaving him standing alone. By, himself in the massive field. Where everyone can see him. The back of his neck prickles as he shrinks underneath the numerous gazes of the crowd feeling vulnerable and exposed as he hears confused murmurs pass through the throng of people. God, what the fuck is happening? 
Why didn't recovery girl tell him more? This is so embarrassing what is he supposed to do? Maybe if he just walks off like, it's natural then nobody will notice? There's an entrance tunnel nearby, maybe he can hey, hey, hey. Present Mick's loud voice echoes throughout the stadium, you may be wondering why this little guy here didn't join them. Is Yuku jumps, eyes wide. What is going on? Well, that's because this is Madraya is Yuku, the young apprentice of I's very own recovery girl. Word is that he's got the best, damn healing quirk anyone's ever seen. So be sure to give this kid a cheer he'll be making sure our students live to fight another day after today. Ha ha ha. Is Yuku flushes as the crowd erupts into cheers. It's different from before, not like they're cheering for the upcoming violence and competitive spirit. It's more polite and encouraging, and it makes Is Yuku smile despite his nervousness. He gives a little wave before disappearing into one of the entrance tunnels, letting out a huge sigh of relief once he's out of the public eye. Recovery girl laughs at him when he returns to the infirmary. How could you do that to me? He cries, burying his face in his hands. The older woman just laughs and pats his back. Why didn't you warn me? I wanted it to be a surprise. Her eyes, sparkle with mirth. I felt bad that, you were going to be helping me the whole time while all the other first years get to participate in the sports festival. So, I asked present Mick to shine the spotlight on you briefly so you could have your moment of glory. Izuku's face somehow turns even redder. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to simultaneously throw up, shit my pants, have a heart attack, and then just die, right in front of everyone. Recovery girl dissolves into peals of high-pitched laughter and he smiles despite himself. Thanks, I guess, he eventually mumbles, trying to rub the heat out of his cheeks. His mentor giggles for another moment before catching her breath. Come on, she says, still smiling, we should pay attention to the race. Oh right, Izuku says, what did I miss? Totoraki-kun, throws everyone. Of course he did. They both turn towards a screen in the corner of the room showing a live broadcast of the sports festival. The vast majority of the students are still trapped in the tunnel, their feet frozen to the ground by Totoraki's eyes. Said boy is currently running ahead towards a group of enormous robots, the rest of class 1A and a few others right on his heels. They, all stop when they reach the robots, obviously trying to figure out a plan to get past, but Totoraki doesn't hesitate for long. One loud crackle and a blast of ice later, the massive machines are frozen stiff. Totoraki runs between their legs, leaving the rest of the students behind him stunned. Recovery girl lets out an impressed whistle. Well, there's something to be said about brute force, she makes a couple more comments after that, but her voice fades into the background as Izuku gazes at Totoraki running on the screen. He hasn't really spoken to the boy in a while. Not since. One morning, five days before the sports festival, Izuku is walking down an empty hallway to the infirmary for his usual check-in with his mentor. He hums to himself idly wondering what he'll have for, lunch, when the low voice reaches his ear. Midraya kun Izuku startles so badly he nearly trips. D. Totoraki kun He shrieks, stumbling as he whirls around to face the boy, oh my god, don't scare me like that. Totoraki blinks slowly at him. Izuku presses a hand to his chest to ease his racing heart. What are you doing here? He asks, it's early. Totoraki shifts, not quite meeting his gaze, for a moment, then says, I was injured during a training accident last night. His voice betrays nothing, but the implication is clear. Huh? Oh. Izuku straightens up. I was just on my way to meet with recovery girl San. If you come with me, she'll know. Totoraki says sharply. Izuku jumps in surprise and even the other boy seems startled by his own outburst. Clearing his throat, he says, no. There's no need to bother her with this. Your quirk should be enough. With that said, he reaches for Izuku's hand, but the green it pulls back. He eyes Totoraki uncertainly, but the other boy's face remains impassive. 
Something about this doesn't feel quite right. Why wouldn't Totoraki want to see Recovery Girl? Is something wrong? Totoraki tilts his head. Is there? Is Yuku asks. Why don't you want to go to Recovery Girl San? Totoraki gazes at him for a few seconds, then says, Her quirk will make me tired. Yours won't. Oh. It's a fair point, but is Yuku struggles to find a response. Um, well, he stammers. Can can I at least see your injury first? Totoraki pauses, then his eyes briefly flicker down the hallway before his hands reach up to unbutton his shirt. When he exposes his shoulder, Izuku winces. A large, severe burn spreads across his skin from his collarbone to his shoulder. It looks hastily wrapped in gauze, but he can easily see the injury underneath. He hisses between his teeth as he gently reaches to undo the gauze. Geez, Totoraki-kun, this looks like it's almost third degree. How on earth did this happen? Totoraki is silent for a moment. Like, I said, it was a training accident. Izuku's attention is on his burn, so he doesn't see his expression, but he can hear how carefully blank he's keeping his voice. He glances between Totoraki's face and his injury. Training. He murmurs. He doesn't recall Totoraki getting injured during yesterday, and it can't be the product of his own quirk since it's on his left side what kind of fire, quirk would burn its user question mark so that only leaves. Or you. Training at home? He asks cautiously, with. Endeavor? Did. Did he do this? Totoraki's jaw clenches briefly before his gaze turns to meet his Yuku's. It was just a training accident. Voice devoid of emotion. He's lying. Izuku doesn't know why or how, but something in his chest tells him that Totoraki is lying. He stares at the taller, boy, hoping to find some hint of something he doesn't know what but Totoraki just stares back at him, eyes cold and intense. Izuku averts his gaze. Well, fine. If he wants to be stubborn. He turns his attention to the burn. I can heal this. But once I do my quirk will probably try to heal your scar as well. It addresses fresh wounds before old ones, so if you don't want that to happen, then, just pull away as soon as your burn heals. It's easy to fall into a more professional tone, but his mind still races. Alright. Izuku gently places his hand on Totoraki's shoulder, and as soon as his skin turns smooth again the boy pulls away. Thanks, Totoraki says buttoning up his shirt again. Izuku presses his lips together uncertainly. Totoraki-kun. He opens his mouth to say more, only, he finds that he really doesn't know what to say right now. Totoraki sees his escape and turns away without sparing him another glance. See you in class. Totoraki doesn't come to him with any more burns, but the hard rock in the pit of Izuku's stomach doesn't disappear. Warayakun? Midraya-kun? Are you listening to me? Recovery girl's voice snaps him out of his stupor. Huh? He glances at his mentor and winces at her annoyed expression. Sorry, sorry, what did you say? She huffs through her nose. I know this is all exciting, but it's important to stay focused today I know, I know. He waves his hands. I'm sorry. I just. He sighs and shakes his head to clear his thoughts. It won't happen again. Good. Recovery girl nods. Well, I was saying that we're probably going to get flooded with kids after this first race, so let's do what we did when that stampede happened. Treat them with traditional means and send the worse ones over to me. What about Mike work? He asks, isn't this a good opportunity to train? Yes, but I need you to save your energy for the battle tournament, she explains, of course. Don't tell anyone I told you this, but it's going to be a series, of one-on-one -on -one battles. It's like a bracket system, you know? They fight and fight until one person comes out on top. Foolish and barbaric if you ask me. She grumbles the last part and is Yuku snorts. Anyway, the winners of each match have to go on to fight another, but they're often injured from the previous fight. It's always been such a pain to figure out how to deal with them because Mike work, will sap them of the strength they need for their battles. 
But now I have you. His mentor smiles and rubs her forehead. Oh, Midraya Kun, you are a godsend right now. I'm so glad I don't have to deal with these idiot kids throwing themselves at each other all by myself anymore. Izuku knows just what to say to cheer her up. Nedzu-san works you too hard. Yes, he does. She cries out, then, huffs good-naturedly, all right, come on you, let's get to work. It soon becomes clear that the obstacle race is really between Totoraki and Kaken, the two being leagues ahead of the other students. Izuku is surprised that Ida isn't doing as well as he thought he would, considering that it is a race, but the camera hardly focuses on the stragglers as Totoraki and Kaken enter the minefield. He, knows he needs to remain unbiased neutral, as all healers should be but he can't help the little leap of excitement his heart gives when he sees Kaken start to overtake Totoraki. They push and pull at each other, trying to slow each other down. But when the rest of the students start to catch up they break apart. Between Totoraki sliding on his ice and Kaken propelling himself with his, explosions, it's a tight race, but Totoraki ends up winning by a hair breadth. Izuku is mildly surprised, but he doesn't have much time to think about his undoubtedly pissed off friend before students start coming into the infirmary with injuries. After that, he hardly has time to pay attention to the festival at all too busy looking over patients and treating what he can alongside recovery girl. Thanks to Totoraki, most of the injuries involve frostbite. The boy didn't melt his ice like he did with Ojiro and Hagakure, so the prolonged exposure resulted in more damage this time. Fortunately, none of the students have any dead tissue, so it's mostly just a process of rewarming the skin and bandaging it up in some cases. When he glances up at the screen again, the cavalry battle is occurring. Once again, everyone, including present Mick, realizes that it's really just a fight between Kaken and Totoraki. Izuku briefly wonders how the blonde's wrists are doing he's never seen him use his quirk so much before. A moment later, however, his attention is drawn back to his work. They make good time going through the numerous wounded students, but a decent handful have injuries aside from, frostbite and it takes him a moment to realize that some of the students coming in are upperclassmen. He knows that the second and third year's sports festivals happen at the same time, but he has no idea where they are. The first year's stage is massive, how could they fit two more into the stadium? He brushes it off as I just being huge and focuses on his work. It's not particularly difficult. He doesn't come across anything that, he's never dealt with before but it's taxing and he's been on his feet constantly since leaving the train this morning. By the time he's able to look at the screen again, the cavalry battle is almost over. He watches as Kaken lunges towards Totoraki, who has barricaded his team in ice. The blonde snarls and grabs onto his left forearm and this must be it. Totoraki is definitely going to use his, fire now. Except. He doesn't. Instead. He lets Kaken yank his arm aside and grab one of his headbands, ripping it off as he flies by. Even through the screen, Izuku can see the burn that is left on Totoraki's arm when Kaken lets go. Despite his efforts, however, it seems that the wrong headband was grabbed, because Totoraki remains in first place with over 10 million points. The crowd draws, and cheers, but Izuku just winces. Kaken has lost twice to Totoraki. No doubt his friend is furious. And he most certainly is. Thankfully, Izuku is the only one in the infirmary when Kaken bursts in. There are surprisingly few injuries after the cavalry battle, and those that are wounded are seen to quickly. Recovery girl steps out for a moment to restock their supply of bandages and gauze, telling Izuku to hold the fort before leaving. So, Izuku is able to give his friend his full attention as he comes stomping into the infirmary, visibly seething. That half and half motherfucker. He hisses, his red pupils mere pinpricks, that's the last time he'll make a fool out of me. I'm not gonna fuck around anymore. Unperturbed, Izuku simply asks, are you injured? Kaken grits his, teeth and shoves his forearms towards him. I would have blasted him out of the ring at the end there, he growls, but my wrists were fucking killing me. 
I suppose there wouldn't be any point in telling you to take it easy, is Yuku sighs, gently placing his hands on his wrists and letting his energy flow. Recovery girl hasn't told him to start using his quirk yet, but he assumes that it's okay, since Kakan is going to be fighting in the battle tournament. But at least be careful. Now rejuvenated, Kakan testingly rolls his wrists and bares his teeth in a grin. I'm gonna wipe the floor with his ass? Kakan, is Yuku huffs. Yeah, yeah, I'll be careful too. Kakan rolls his eyes. Come on, the lunch break just started. Let's go eat, I'm fucking starving. Oh, uh. Is Yuku glances, around the empty infirmary. I don't know if it would be such a good idea for me to leave. What, you don't get a lunch break? Kakan scowls. Don't act like you are not hungry. Doesn't your quirk work better if you're full? Let me just wait for recovery girl San to get back, is Yuku says, she shouldn't take long. But why don't you go ahead and get in line for us? I'll join you soon. Kakan, looks like he might argue, but then his own stomach lets out an audible growl. Fine. As soon as he's gone, is Yuku flops down in the nearest chair with a heavy sigh. His feet ache. And even though he hasn't used his quirk that much yet, he feels like he could go for a nice long nap. He's about to close his eyes just to rest for a little bit when a knock on the door startles him. It can't be, recovery girl. She would have just walked in, so it must be another injured student. Stifling a sigh, Izuku drags himself to his feet and opens the door. Totoraki-kun. Said boy seems slightly surprised to see him. I thought you'd be at lunch. Izuku shakes his head and steps aside to let him in. Recovery girl San stepped out for a minute, so I was waiting for her to get back first. He trails, off when his eyes land on the burn on Totoraki's left forearm. He grimaces. Man, Kakin really doesn't know how to hold back. Why would he? Totoraki asks as Izuku leads him to sit on one of the beds. The greenet doesn't respond instead looking over the boy for any other injuries. He has a few other burns from Kakin that he must have gotten while they were scuffling during the obstacle, race. Like with Yuraraka, Totoraki's uniform has been seared into his skin in some places. Izuku makes a disgruntled noise and walks over to one of the drawers. I'll have to remove the burned cloth from your wounds before I can heal them, he says, grabbing some tweezers and scissors, but it shouldn't take too long. Totoraki nods but doesn't respond. Izuku quietly gets to work on the burn on his, shoulder. The same shoulder that had been burned just about the same last week. Izuku presses his lips into a thin line. He doesn't really know what to think about. All this. Everything involving Totoraki. There's too many confusing hints, too many questions that he doesn't have the answers to. But at the same time he's afraid of what those answers might be. He glances at his burned arm. You, no, he murmurs softly, if you had used your fire I won't use my fire, Totoraki interrupts, not looking at him. Izuku hesitates, then, it would have been to your advantage. I don't care. His voice is cold. I'll win without using my left side. He sounds so resolute, like he decided this a long time ago. It's confusing. And it only makes the hard ball in the pit of Izuku's stomach get, even heavier. There's just something about the way that Totoraki speaks, so meticulously devoid of any emotion, like he's trying to hide something. Or protect himself. Still treading carefully, Izuku says, you. Don't seem to be very fond of fire. It's more of a comment than anything, an idle musing while he plucks bits of charred fabric out of the burn. Totoraki remains quiet. Izuku swallows, does. Does that have anything to do with Endeavor? A long, tense silence follows. Slowly, Totoraki's face turns towards him. Izuku keeps his eyes on the burn, but his hands aren't moving. He's too nervous to do anything but wait for the response, trying not to suffocate under the rising tension. Finally, Midraya I just noticed things, you know. Izuku blurts out, completely interrupting him. It's just I don't even know you that well, but whenever you've mentioned training with your father or not using your fire I just you never seem. 
happy about it, you know? Not that you have to be thrilled or anything. He's rambling now. But I just started thinking I couldn't help but wonder, especially with your scar and then when you came to me with that burn, I just I just, Midraya Kun, Totoraki tries to interject. I don't want to make assumptions, you know? But everything that I've seen from you kind of looks a certain way and I can't help but worry Madraya Kun. And I know it's absolutely none of my business anyway. Izuku waves his hands frantically. I'm totally being rude here, but I. He trails off, struggling to find his words. All he can think about, is the burn that was on Totoraki's shoulder, how painful it looked and how he lied he lied, Izuku knows he did, but what can he do? The helpless feeling that he hates with a passion returns, frustration burning his throat. I. I'm a healer, Totoraki-kun, he whispers, head bowed, I want to help people. I want to save people, but I can't. All I can do is heal them after they've been hurt. He, takes in a deep, shuddering breath and looks up at Totoraki with a weak smile. But I've always wanted to be a hero. I hate not being able to stop people from getting hurt. So, please, Totoraki-kun. I don't know what's going on, but if there's anything I can do to help you. Totoraki stares at him for a few moments, eyes slightly widened. Then, he blinks and his face becomes impassive once more, there isn't. Izuku swallows and tries to stifle his disappointment. Oh, he whispers. Totoraki looks like he might say something else, but when he doesn't, Izuku wordlessly averts his gaze, turning his attention back to his injured shoulder. He dutifully picks the bits of fabric out of the burn, ignoring the pair of mismatched eyes that stare at his face as he works. There are only a couple of other burns that need his attention, smaller ones that he cleans fairly quickly. Then, he leans back and starts to take off his gloves. Totoraki's hand shoots out. He catches him by the wrist, just below his palm, carefully avoiding the bare skin below his glove. Izuku startles and looks up at Totoraki to see him staring at him. T Totoraki-kun? The taller boy slowly slides off the bed, making the Greena take a step back as he stands in front of him. Izuku pales as Totoraki gazes down at him, something unreadable in his eyes. I don't need you to save me, he says. Izuku blinks. Totoraki presses his lips in a thin line and tries again. I mean. It's nothing I can't handle on my own, so don't worry about it. Unwittingly, Izuku's eyes flicker over to his shoulder, then back to his face. A soft sigh passes through Totoraki's nose. He seems to be considering something. 2. Totoraki-kun. I'm sure you know, the other boy says, that Endeavor has been stuck as the number 2 hero forever. My old man has a strong desire to rise in the world. As a hero, he won a name for himself with crushing force. Because of that, the living legend, All Might, is a great eyesore to him. Since he couldn't surpass All Might, he moved on to his next plan. You've heard of quirk marriages, right? Izuku is a bit taken aback by the turn of the conversation, but he doesn't want to risk saying anything that might make Totoraki stop. He has a feeling this is finally going to clear up everything he's been wondering about. Totoraki continues, that thing became a problem for the second and third generation after superpowers appeared. Choosing a spouse based only on strengthening your own quirk and passing it on to your children, forcing people into marriage. His eyes narrow. The old-fashioned way of thinking is brought about by a lack of ethics. He is a man with both accomplishments and money. He won over my mother's relatives and got a hold of her quirk. He is trying to fulfill his own desire by raising me to be a hero to surpass all might. Izuku's breath hitches. Totoraki isn't even looking at him anymore, instead, he's scowling at the ground. It's so annoying, he hisses through gritted teeth, I won't become the tool of scum like that. In my memories, my mother is always crying. She told me my left side was unsightly as she poured boiling water on me. Izuku's eyes widen as Totoraki raises his hand to cover his scar, he feels like he can't breath. That scar. He knew it wasn't from fire, but 
his own mother. Totoraki's voice brings him out of his thoughts. I will reject him completely by winning first place without using my damn old man's quirk. His hand drops and he fixes Izuku with a determined look. So, no. I do not need to be saved. I have a plan, and it will work. He looks so stubborn and resolute, that Izuku almost believes him. Totoraki-kun. The door slides open. Sorry about the wait, Midraya-kun. Recovery girl chirps as she walks in, her arms full of bandages and gauze. Izuku takes a step back and Totoraki lets go of his wrist, as if he didn't realize he was still holding on to it. Oh, hello, Totoraki-kun. Recovery girl notices the boy. You've done very well so far. Is everything, alright? She directs the question to Izuku, frowning at the burns on Totoraki. Izuku straightens up, trying to recollect his whirling mind. Oh, yes. I just had to remove some pieces of cloth that were seared into his skin. He turns back to Totoraki, taking off his glove. I, I can heal it now. Remember to focus on the flow, his mentor reminds him as he places his hand on the burn. He tries, to concentrate, he really does, but Totoraki just dropped a huge bombshell on him. Endeavor is, really that awful? The number two hero. Izuku remembers a time before his quirk manifested when he was interested in the flame hero. He wanted someone to look up to in case he inherited his father's fire-breathing quirk. But even though he never seemed too friendly on the news or even during the recommendation exam, Izuku never would have thought. Endeavor is supposed to be a hero, how could he do something so horrible? Like before, Totoraki pulls away from his touch before he can heal his scar. Thanks, he mutters, already turning away. Before he can leave, however, Recovery Girl calls out, Oh, Totoraki-kun. Why don't you take Madriyakun with you to lunch? You both need to eat well, before the final event. Totoraki pauses at the door and Izuku hastily trots after him, saying goodbye to his mentor as he leaves. They walk down the hallway in silence. Pretty much everyone is busy getting lunch, so it's mostly empty. Izuku casts a glance at Totoraki, but the taller boy isn't looking at him. There's still something that he didn't quite confirm. Although, from the way he talked about Endeavor, it's fairly obvious. Despite Totoraki's odd attempt at reassurance, Izuku still feels a flare of protectiveness in his chest. If, if he tries to hurt you again, he won't, Totoraki says, he knows better than to leave a mark on me when I have school the next day. A pause. His lips press together. Usually, Totoraki's words don't bring Izuku any ease. Instead, his stomach, churns even more. He glances at Totoraki's healed forearm. Something tugs at his heart. They part ways during lunch. Kakin has already gotten both of their meals when he meets him. The blonde loudly complains about how long he took to get there, but Izuku can't find it in himself to say much in response. Kakin casts him a couple of odd, quizzical glances as they eat with their friends, no doubt. Noticing his sudden lack of enthusiasm. Not wanting to worry his friend, Izuku plasters on a smile and forces himself to eat, despite the fact that he actually feels quite nauseous. There isn't much to do when he goes back to the infirmary, so he just idly watches the broadcast of the sports festival. Midnight announces what the final round of the competition will be, and Ojiro surprises everyone, by withdrawing along with a boy from class 1b. Izuku tries to pay attention, but all he can think about is what Totoraki told him. The ache in his chest grows bigger. What does he do now? One of his classmates is being. Being abused by his father. A pro hero. This is really serious should he tell an adult? He isn't sure if they'd believe him without proof, but he is a healer. Or, at least, he's, going to be. He wonders if doctor-patient confidentiality applies to his case too. But if he did tell someone, Totoraki might not ever forgive him. He probably wouldn't have told Izuku his secret if he didn't have some level of trust in him he doesn't want to betray that. It might even just make things worse, Endeavor is an immensely powerful man, 
not just physically, but socially too. If it came, to a legal battle, there's no way he'd go down easy. And Totoraki would be the one having to deal with the repercussions. Swallowing past the hard lump in his throat, Izuku looks down at his lap. He needs to ease his mind somehow. He needs. He needs. He takes out his phone. Midrayo 1.15 p.m. Hi, Tasha Norai 1.15 p.m. Hello, young Midrayo. How are things on your end? Midrayo 1.16 p.m. Fine. Bit of a lull right now. Where are you? Tasha Norai 1.16 p.m. I'm at the third year's stage in the teacher's booth. Why? Izuku briefly wonders why All Might is watching the third years instead of the first, but saves the question for later. Midrayo 1.17 p.m. Can I ask you a question? Tasha Norai 1.17 p.m. Of course. Izuku stares down at his phone. He starts typing the response, then almost immediately deletes it, how does he ask this? After a few more typed and deleted responses, he finally hits send. Midrayo 1.20 p.m. Can I call you? Tasha Norai 1.24 p.m. Yes. Can I go to the bathroom? Recovery girl glances up in surprise. You don't have to ask me, she replies, but the recreational games are going to be over soon, so don't take too long. Izuku nods and tries not to rush out of the infirmary too, quickly. Instead of heading towards the bathroom, he finds himself in empty hallway and presses the call button. Young Madraya. All Might's voice sounds a little breathless as if he also hurried to find a quiet spot. Is everything alright? Are you okay? I'm fine, I'm fine, Izuku sighs, leaning against the wall. He winces. Actually. Maybe not so much. Are you hurt? Where are you? I'll, come no, no, it's okay. I'm not hurt, I just he cuts himself off with a rough exhale, struggling to find his words as he pinches the bridge of his nose. All might. I. What would you do if. If you knew someone was in trouble, but they didn't want your help? Or young Madraya. All Might sounds bewildered. If. If you know you shouldn't meddle because. Because it's none of your business. And it might make things worse anyway. Izuku lets out a heavy sigh, but but you can't just sit back and do nothing, you know? All Might is quiet for a long time. Izuku knows that he's probably confused the man but he can't think of another way to ask. After a few beats of silence, All Might says, I. I think I would just do what my heart tells me is right. I've always believed that meddling, when you don't need to is the essence of being a hero. Somehow, the words make Izuku's chest feel just a bit lighter. His mind is still in turmoil, but now. He knows he should do something. He has to do something. He doesn't know what yet but the resolve is enough to steady him. Thanks, All Might. He smiles softly even though the man can't see him. Are you sure you're okay? All Might, asks, I'm assuming those questions weren't rhetorical. No, but you helped. He hears a particularly loud cheer come from outside. I think I should go now. Will I see you later? I don't know. I'll text you if I can't stop by. Okay. Bye. Izuku hangs up and walks back to the infirmary. Chapter 15 The first match of the battle tournament is between Asui and the purple-haired boy from General Studies, whose name is apparently Shinsu Hitoshi. He's curious as to what his quirk is, but he doesn't get to see it because as soon as the match starts, Asui flicks out her tongue and wraps it around Shinsu's waist, flinging him out of bounds. It's an awfully swift defeat and Izuku spares a wince of pity for the other boy as he claps for his classmate. Shinsu seemed so determined to get into the hero course, it's kind of unfortunate that he got taken down so easily. But perhaps it was just a bad matchup. Or, Izuku reconsiders as he watches Asui turn away without a single ounce of remorse on her face, perhaps he shouldn't have pissed off class 1A. The next match has the crowd roaring with excitement. It's only natural, Totoraki has taken first place in the preliminary events, he'd probably make sports festival history if he won in all three competitions. Izuku feels a little bad for Sero. 
Despite being friends with the boy, Totoraki is the most powerful student in Class 1A for a reason. Hopefully, the fight won't be as short as the last one start. Actually, it turns out to be even shorter. The crowd is dead quiet. A massive glacier stands in the middle of the arena, jagged spikes jutting over the top of the stadium. It groans under its own weight, and even in the infirmary Izuku can feel how cold the air has suddenly gotten. Everyone, including Izuku, stares in awe at the evidence of Totoraki's sheer power. At the very bottom of the glacier, Saro stands nearly completely frozen in ice. Don't. Don't you think that's a bit much? His voice is tiny over, the TV screen. Recovery girl lets out a whoosh of air. I'll repeat myself, there is something to be said about brute force. Even she sounds impressed. Then, she huffs, but this boy is giving us an awful lot of frostbite to deal with. Izuku doesn't respond, too busy watching as Totoraki moves towards Sero the moment his victory is announced. The boy stands under the eyes of the crowd shouting, condolences for his defeated opponent, melting what he had frozen himself with his left hand. There's no triumph in his posture, however. No. Even though Izuku can't see his face, something about Totoraki seems very sad to him. Ah, uh, well, recovery girl TSKS a few moments later, catching his attention once more, I'll go ahead and see to that poor boy. Stay here in case anyone comes by, you know the drill. Izuku nods, noticing that, Saro is looking a little stiff as he's finally freed from his icy prison. Once the glacier is melted, present Mick announces a brief hiatus while the stage dries off. Izuku turns away from the screen, frowning. That was certainly an impressive display of power from Totoraki. Unnecessary, though. He could have defeated Saro with a much smaller attack, so what prompted him to? To show off like that? He gets his answer when Totoraki walks through the door again a few minutes later, this time without knocking. He's glaring at the ground and his jaw is clenched, but he looks up when he sees Izuku. The freckled boy pauses, taking him in. A thin layer of frost coats his right side, spanning across his skin and creeping onto his cheek. Looking closer, Izuku also realizes that he's shivering ever so, slightly. Totoraki doesn't seem like he's going to move any closer, so Izuku gets up and slowly approaches him. Mismatched eyes watch him for a moment, then drop. Saw my old man before the match, he says quietly as Izuku comes to stand in front of him, told me to stop being childish and to focus on surpassing all might. Izuku gazes at him, then looks at his nearly frozen right side. He can't see his skin, but he has no doubt that there's frostbite. His hand reaches for his arm, but the layer of ice prevents him from making skin contact. He hesitates. Totoraki-kun. You need to unfreeze yourself. Totoraki acts like he doesn't hear him. His fist clenches. I got angry, he hisses through clenched teeth. His gaze is still averted. Totoraki-kun, Izuku says gently putting a hand on his shoulder to make him look at him you are going to hurt yourself i need you to warm yourself up totoraki inhales shakily through his nose and when he exhales a cold puff of air brushes as yuku's curls he's never seen his classmate look so ruffled before it doesn't show on his face but he can see the swirling turmoil of emotions in his eyes he seems lonely so terribly miserably lonely. And maybe that's why he told Izuku about his past. Maybe that's why he's come to him now, because he's the only one who knows. Because he just needed someone to understand. It must be so horribly isolating to have to go through what Totoraki has gone through all on his own. He always seems so stoic, but maybe. Maybe he just needs a friend. Totoraki stares at him for a few moments, slowly breathing, in and out. Gradually, the ice on his body starts to melt away, revealing red, irritated skin. It's not as bad as Izuku thought it would be, but he reaches out to heal it anyways. Totoraki steps back after a second. Neither of them speak right away. Totoraki's eyes are still troubled, switching back and forth between quiet distress and cold fury. 
is Yuko takes a deep, steadying breath. Then I, I'm sorry about everything that happened to you, he says, keeping his voice soft, but I still think you should use your fire. Totoraki's jaw clenches. Weren't you listening to what I said? I don't need his power to win. I refuse to let myself be controlled by him. But you are, is Yuku insists. He has no idea what he's doing, but All Might told him to do what his heart tells him, so he's going, to listen. Even if it's not what Totoraki wants to hear. You are letting yourself be controlled by him. You're? You're letting him hold you back. This hatred you hold for him is only going to hurt you. It's not that simple. Totoraki glowers. I know it's not. I know there's a lot more to it, and I know there's probably a lot I still don't know about, as Yuku admits, I don't think I'll ever, truly understand what you've gone through, but. You're letting him become a weakness. If you keep this up, if you keep ignoring this other half of you, all you're going to do is hurt yourself. You know you're susceptible to frostbite, you need the heat to negate the effects. You could be so much stronger if you just don't. Totoraki suddenly snaps, pulling away, don't say that. Don't sound, like him. Izuku pauses, holding up his hands placatingly. Totoraki watches him with narrowed eyes for a tense moment, but it doesn't seem like he's about to run away. Slowly, carefully, Izuku continues. I'm just going to say this. Everyone out there is giving it their best. Two. To ignore half of yourself, to only fight with half of your power it's incredibly disrespectful to your peers. Everyone has worked so hard to get to this point. How do you think it would feel if someone beat you with one of their hands tied behind their back? Totoraki's eyes flash, but he says nothing. Izuku takes a deep breath. I get that you want to spite your father by winning the sports festival without your fire, but how far will that take you? How far will spite and anger take you? Will you be a hero fueled by those negative emotions? Because let me tell you something Totoraki-kun, if that's the case, then you're going to become just like your father. It's harsh, and Izuku hates saying it, but it's necessary. Totoraki inhales sharply and for a moment. A brief flash of anger passes over his face. He opens his mouth to retort, or yell, or curse, but nothing comes out. He just keeps staring, at Izuku with wide, unreadable eyes. He needs to end this. I know you hate your father, Totoraki-kun, Izuku whispers, but you shouldn't hate your quirk too. Totoraki's breath hitches. It's not he stutters, I. His power I won't that catches Izuku's attention. It's not his power, he says firmly, it's yours, isn't it? That's why your body aches for the heat it knows is there. That's why, denying this half of yourself will only get you hurt, will only make you weak. He gives him a weak, sad smile. And that is how Endeavor is still controlling you. Silence follows his words. Totoraki stares at him, his face going slack. He's completely still, not moving a single inch as he stays rooted to the spot, his eyes never leaving Izuku's for a second. He looks. God, Izuku can't even, describe the expression on his face. But it doesn't matter, because in the next moment he lets out a slow, shaky exhale, as if he'd been holding his breath for minutes. As the air escapes his lips, steam starts rising off the left side of his body. Izuku smiles. You can do it, he says softly. Totoraki's throat clicks as he swallows. Then, a small flame flickers to life on his left forearm, soon, joined by another, then another, until a thin line of flames is dancing along his arm, curling around his shoulder and flitting between his fingers. Another shuddering sigh. His hand clenches. The flames go out. I. I can't his voice rasps and he coughs slightly to clear it. I can't control it. That's fine, Izuku says, you'll learn. Like we all do. Holding his gaze, Totoraki slowly nods, he still looks uncertain, but it's enough. Not much is said between them after that. They kind of just stand there for a while, Izuku waiting patiently as Totoraki works through whatever thoughts and emotions he's battling with now. His brows are furrowed as he looks at the ground, 
but he occasionally glances back up at his yuku, expression unreadable. Soon, the familiar pitter-patter of recovery, girl's footsteps approaches from the hall, dragging them both out of their reverie. The door slides open and his mentor startles when she sees them both standing there. Before she can say anything, however, Totoraki bows his head politely and steps past her. He glances back at Izuku one last time before the door closes, and when their eyes meet, he can hear Totoraki's wordless response clearly, Thank you. The fight between Kakan and Uraraka is brutal to watch. Not because of the merciless explosions the blonde sends her way, but because, despite the obvious, immense differences in their strength, Uraraka still gets so close to winning. No matter how many times she gets blasted across the arena, she gets right back up and tries even harder. She comes up with a brilliant plan, one that takes the whole audience by surprise, but it's all for naught. Kakan is too strong, too clever, and he burns her plan to smithereens and fights until she collapses. Izuku is grateful that Aizawa defended Kakan the way he did. He knows his friend better than anyone, and when the crowd started accusing him of being cruel, his heart sank to his stomach. But Aizawa made everyone realize that all Kakan was doing was acknowledging the strength of his opponent and doing what he had to in order to come out on top. Izuku wonders when Aizawa got to know Kakan so well. Recovery Girl stays true to her word and doesn't allow him to heal Uraraka since she lost. She heals the worst of Uraraka's wounds with her quirk, leaving her only with a few scratches that Izuku cleans and bandages. He manages to convince his mentor to let him escort her back to the stands, but once they leave, Uraraka insists on going to one of the waiting rooms instead. You really don't have to come with me. She says, smiling reassuringly, I feel fine now, just a little tired from recovery girl's quirk. I just want to make sure you get there all right. It's the least I could do. He rubs the back of his neck uncertainly. I, I feel a little bad. I know Kakan can be rough, but I'm glad he didn't hold back, your Araka interrupts, sounding surprisingly unbothered, even though losing sucks. I think I would have felt even worse if he had let me win. At least I know that he was taking me seriously. Oh. He blinks, taking aback. That's. That's really mature, you're a rock a -kun. He smiles at her. She returns his smile, then bares her teeth in determination. You better tell your precious Kakan that I'm going to kick his ass next time. Izuku lets out a surprised laugh. Uraraka laughs too, dispelling any worries that might have weighed at his heart. He wonders why he doesn't hang out with her more often she's so cool. He escorts her to one of the waiting rooms and leaves when she tells him that she's going to call her, father. A particularly loud cheer from the arena lets him know that Kirishima and Tetsuya Tetsu's match must have ended, so he hurries to get back to the infirmary. Before he can even get close though, Endeavor suddenly appears out of nowhere stepping into the corridor. Izuku just barely manages to stop himself from colliding with the man. Squeaking in surprise, he stumbles backwards as Endeavor's gaze turns to him. Oh! It's you, he rumbles in a low voice. Izuku gulps and tries not to cower. The flame hero is surrounded in such an intense aura that Izuku feels like he could suffocate if he gets too close. The fact that he's massive doesn't help either. He hasn't seen Endeavor since the recommendation exam. Recalling the hostility he faced makes Izuku's stomach churn with anxiety. Recovery, girls scolding no doubt wounded Endeavor's pride, but surely he wouldn't be so outwardly aggressive towards Izuku now. It was just a misunderstanding, a mistake on the hero's part for making assumptions. Judging by Endeavor's expression as he gazes down at him now, he can tell that the older man doesn't quite know what to make of him. Izuku, on the other hand, knows exactly how he feels about Endeavor now that he knows the truth from Totoraki. He has more than a few choice words to throw in his face if only he could get past his nerves. You healed my son after the cavalry battle, didn't you? Endeavor eyes him up and down. Izuku gulps, nodding. He gets the feeling that the man is rather unimpressed. Thank you for that. However, 
It was foolish of him to get injured in the first place. It was easily avoidable too. He growls, seemingly to himself, then says, if he gets hurt by that Bukigu boy again, don't heal him. Is Yuku stiffens. Er. He stammers, healing is. Kind of my job. He needs to learn his lesson, Endeavor insists, my shadow should be strong enough to avoid getting injuries. Is Yuku's jaw clenches. My shadow, he said, as if Totoraki is some sort of possession. It ignites a familiar feeling in Izuku's chest, one that's both indignant and desperate for freedom at the same time. I'm going to become the best damn hero this world has ever seen, and you're going to become the best damn healer. And you are going to be mine. Ah. That's why this is familiar. Yeah, alright, sure, Izuku huffs sarcastically, but when recovery girl San gets pissed, off, I'm sending her to you. Endeavor raises a brow. I see her attitude has already rubbed off on you. He lifts his chin and haughtily gazes down at him. Forgive me for asking, but what exactly is your relationship with our beloved symbol of peace? Izuku blinks in surprise. Huh? Endeavor narrows his eyes. I've been trying to figure you out ever since the recommendation exam. I can't imagine why someone like All Might would go out of his way to sponsor someone who won't even be a real hero. Now that pisses his Yuku off. Straightening up, he glares at Endeavor and says, Well, perhaps All Might simply wanted to help me out because he's smart enough to recognize the importance of healers, especially to hero schools like him. His tone drips with false politeness. I didn't mean to, imply that they're not important, Endeavor growls lowly, but their place certainly isn't within the ranks of future heroes as if they're equals. I don't understand why All Might would waste his precious time in the first place. Izuku has to repeatedly remind himself that punching a pro hero would not be a wise idea. He knows what Endeavor is looking for. He wants to know how the number one hero, happened to meet some kid with a healing quirk, and why he was impressed enough to help him get into one of the best hero schools in Japan. But he can't say that he healed All Might, he can't expose a weakness as great as that, especially not to someone like Endeavor. He needs to get out of this situation. I don't think All Might saw it that way, he says simply, trying to keep his voice steady. But speaking of time, I'm currently wasting mine. So, if you'll excuse me. He averts his gaze and tries to move past, but Endeavor stretches an arm out to stop him. He doesn't touch him, just blocks his path with a large hand. Izuku can feel the heat radiating off it as he turns to look at Endeavor. The flame hero's gaze is piercing, his face showing the barest hints of a snarl as he glares down, at the boy. Why you? He hisses looking as if he's struggling to solve a particularly difficult puzzle. What's so special about you? Izuku's heart threatens to jump out of his throat, but he swallows it down and smiles sweetly up at Endeavor. There's nothing special about me, Endeavor San, he says softly, I'm just a kid with a healing quirk. Endeavor is silent for a few long moments, holding his fiery gaze is just about the hardest thing Izuku has ever done but he manages it until Endeavor finally lowers his hand, letting him walk away. Izuku still feels his eyes drilling holes into the back of his head as he leaves. As soon as he's alone, he leans against a wall and lets out a huge sigh of relief, pressing a hand to his chest to steady his racing heart. He didn't realize it, earlier, but his whole body is trembling faintly. He gives himself a few moments to calm down, then continues on to the infirmary. He really has been gone too long. You know, you two didn't have to come with her, recovery girl says as soon as Izuku steps into the room. He's surprised to see Mirio and Majiki standing together, supporting a girl between them that looks like she's about to pass, out. I'm sure you have your own matches to prepare for. Nonsense. Mirio chirps, friends always come first. We stick together. He spots Izuku and grins brightly. My little Koo Hai. There you are. You certainly took your time, recovery girl says, clearly miffed. Izuku winces. Sorry, I got held up. He eyes the girl worriedly. What's wrong? She raises her head tiredly and gives him a weak, smile, 
But Miru speaks before she can. This is our friend Hado Nejire. She just kicked butt in her last match, but she overused her quirk and now she's super sleepy. Normally, I can't do anything about this one, Recovery Girl says. Her quirk is very similar to yours in that it relies on her utilizing her own stamina. And just like you, when she overuses it she exhausts herself, as Yuku, finishes. His mentor nods. Of course, using my quirk on her would only make things worse, she says, but now we have you. Mirio tilts his head curiously. Your quirk uses your stamina too? Is Yuku nods. Yeah. It's like. Like a transfer of energy. I give people my own energy and it helps heal them. He looks at Hado. I've never tried giving any to someone that isn't injured, but I'll try. Mirio and Majiki watch as Izuku gently places a hand on Hado's forehead. As soon as his quirk activates, he takes note of the girl's own energy. It isn't swirling around any particular point, like it would with a wound, but it definitely feels weak. Almost like how All Might's missing organs felt except that there isn't a complete absence of energy, just a lack of it. As usual, he tries his best, to control the flow of his own energy as it leaves his body, but it escapes him before he can even fully grasp it. Hado perks up as soon as he pulls his hand away. Wow! She exclaims, I feel so much better. Even better than I did this morning. Thanks, Midraya-kun. He smiles. You're welcome. Or Madraya Chan? Mido Chan? Can I call you that? She gasps, eyes widening, can I call you Kuhai? No fair that Tagata Kun gets a Kuhai and I don't. Her cheeks puff up as she pouts. A second later, she smiles again and squeals, Oh, you're just so adorable. I love your hair. Izuku flushes as she squeezes his cheeks and continues to chat away. She really likes to talk a lot. He almost regrets replenishing her energy. Still, he'd take her over Endeavor any day. Er, did you all make it to the, final event? He manages to ask while Hado is taking a breath between sentences. Yup. Mirio puffs up his chest proudly. It's the first time either of us have made it this far. I hate all the attention, a Majiki whispers, eyes fixed on the ground. Izuku frowns in concern. Noticing the slight quiver in the taller boy's frame. As a fellow sufferer of anxiety, he sympathizes. He places a hand on, a Majiki's shoulder, causing him to look up in surprise, and gives him the kindest smile he can offer. Don't worry, a Majiki-kun. I don't like the spotlight either it makes me nervous but you shouldn't let it get to your head. I'm sure you'll do great. A Majiki stares at him, wide-eyed. Then. His face slowly starts turning red. A second later, he suddenly jumps behind Mirio and buries his face in, the boy's back, a deep flush still visible on the tips of his pointy ears. Izuku pulls away and glances at the other two upperclassmen in confusion. Uh. Did I say something wrong? Mirio only answers by bursting out into laughter while Hado rolls her eyes. Alright, alright, recovery girl interrupts. Making a shooing motion with her hands, if you're all fine and dandy now then you can leave, we have work to do. Right, sorry, recovery girl. Mirio apologizes, still smiling. He wraps a beefy arm around each of his friend's shoulders and leads them to the door. See you later, Kuhai. Bye, senpai. Izuku giggles. Hey. Hado protests, twisting around to look at Izuku as she's dragged out the door. You come eat with us at lunch sometime, all right Mido-chan? Uh. Thankfully, Izuku is, saved from answering by the door, closing behind them. Silence fills the infirmary, only broken by the cheers from the TV. Recovery girl sighs, how are you feeling? Izuku blinks and takes note of himself. Oh. Actually, I'm a lot more tired than before. Not exhausted or anything. But I guess Hadoukun needed a lot of energy to replace. Well, sit down for a bit, then, recovery girl says, nodding at his chair, I need you to, last until the final round. From the way things are going. She glances at the TV and Izuku follows her gaze. 
The fight between Totoraki kun and Bakugu kun is going to end in blood. On the screen, Izuku can see the fight between Totoraki and Asui. The frog like girl is agile enough to avoid Totoraki's attacks, but when she tries to grab him with her tongue, he blocks with a wall of ice. It's two long distance fighters against each other. Eventually, however, the chilled temperature of the air begins to affect Asui and she slows down long enough for Totoraki to trap her in a slab of ice, securing his victory. He doesn't use his fire once. Izuku presses his lips together and looks away. I want to ask how Hadokun uses her quirk in battle. He says instead, I know our quirks must work, differently, at least in regards to output, but surely she must have more control over hers than I do. Maybe she can give me some ideas on how I can control mine. Recovery girl hums in thought. It's not a bad idea. You can take her up on that offer to eat lunch with them. Izuku's face heats up. Just the thought of eating lunch with upperclassmen makes him nervous. He never thought he'd be, making friends with third years when he came to up. Asui ends up being carried to the infirmary, fast asleep. Apparently, due to her frog-like nature, when she's exposed to extremely cold temperatures she goes into hibernation. Recovery girl expertly swaddles her in a heated blanket and lets her nap on a bed while Izuku watches the fight between Nida and a girl with a vine quirk from class 1B. The next few matches go fairly quickly. The fight between Kirishima and Kakin is particularly interesting to watch as Yuku's never seen someone who's able to withstand his friend's explosions for so long before. However, despite Kirishima's brawn, Kakin is clever and wins in the end with a round of searing explosions. As soon as the redhead collapses, Recovery Girl sighs and prepares to deal, with more burns. To their surprise, Kakin is the one to bring Kirishima to the infirmary while Ida and Totoraki fight. It's probably because he just wanted to get the gash on his cheek treated, but Izuku doesn't miss the way he glances at Kirishima as the other boy is being treated by Recovery Girl. Izuku arches a brow questioningly when the blonde looks back at him. Kakin pauses, then grunts. Not bad. Izuku gives him a shit eating grin. To no one's surprise, the final round ends up being between Kakin and Totoraki. Izuku takes a seat and watches the screen with bated breath. As much as he loves his best friend, he can't help mentally rooting for Totoraki a little bit. He knows that if Kakin loses to the other boy one more time, he'll be insanely furious. But, if Totoraki is going to use his fire against anyone, it would be Kakin. Only he is strong enough to force it out of him. If Totoraki really wants to win, then he'll have to use his fire against Kakin. Start. Totoraki immediately traps Kakin within a massive glacier, similar to the one he used against Sero. But Kakin blasts his way out of it in a matter of moments. He then uses his explosions to launch himself at Totoraki, grabbing him and launching him over his shoulder, trying to throw him out of bounds. Izuku doesn't miss the way he grabbed Totoraki by his left side pretty much everyone has realized at this point that Totoraki won't use his fire. The boy saves himself from going out of bounds by making an ice slide, but it's a close call. As the fight continues, and Totoraki shows no sign of flames, Izuku steadily gets more and more nervous. The rock in his stomach has returned, but this time, Izuku has trouble sitting still, despite his fatigue. He fidgets and shifts until Recovery Girl asks him what's wrong, to which he responds by asking if he can be excused. I'll be right back, I promise. He says, already rushing out the door. Midraya kun his mentor exclaims. Totoraki is, going to lose. No matter how much ice he sends at Kakin, the blonde just blows it away. He's beginning to tire, his dodges become too narrow, and he's getting burned repeatedly. The crowd roars as Izuku runs down one of the entrance tunnels, stopping right before the edge and takes a deep breath. Sorry, Kakin Totoraki-kun. Don't lose. Do your best. His cry rings across the field. Totoraki, tenses up. Then, the arena bursts into flames. Katsuki can't see Zuku's eyes, but he knows they're not on him. He hears his friend cry out, 
But it's not for him. Once again, Katsuki loses. Somehow, it hurts more this time. Don't fucking touch me. Izuku freezes at Kaken's growl. The blonde is sitting in front of him on the bed, covered from head to toe in a variety of burns, bruises, and frostbite. His whole body is tense, muscles quivering with rage as he glares at the ground with crimson eyes. Usually, when Kaken gets mad, he's loud and violent about it, but now. Izuku has never seen his friend so angry before. He gulps. Ka. Kaken? Kaken doesn't look at him. Just let recovery girl use her quirk on me. Boo but it'll make you tired it's alright, Midraya kun Recovery girl says, watching the two boys carefully, I'll just heal him halfway, so I don't completely drain him. It's not like he has another fight after this. She kisses Kaken on the cheek and the blonde doesn't budge. Doesn't make a sound. Anxiety claws at his Yuku's heart as he turns to his mentor helplessly. She gives him a look, then Kaken, then turns to the door. I'll go see what's keeping that Totoraki boy. She's clearly just giving him and Kaken some space to talk. As soon as she's gone, Izuku turns to his friend nervously. Kaken. I. I understand that you're upset, but you cheered for him, Kaken suddenly says, his voice barely above a whisper, you cheered. For him. Finally, he lifts his head. And when he does, he glares at Izuku. Why? Izuku stares, frozen, how can he explain this to him? He can't tell him about Totoraki's past that would be a huge betrayal of trust. But how could he explain why he's glad that Totoraki won? Why it was more than just about winning for Totoraki? How happy he is that he used his flames. Eventually, he says, I just... I thought if Totoraki-kun didn't use his flames, if he won without them, then it would be worse. For, you, I mean. I know it sucks that he won, but at least you know that he was taking you seriously. He unconsciously repeats Uraraka's words. If, if you had beat him when he was only fighting with half his power, then I think you would have been really upset. Kaken gazes at him for a few moments, then drops his eyes. His shoulders slump. He looks tired. Izuku hesitantly places his hands on Kaken's wrists, sliding them up his forearms as he steps closer between the blonde's thighs. Kaken inhales deeply as his wounds finish healing, then wraps his arms around Izuku's lower back, pulling him closer and plopping his forehead on his shoulder. I. I fucking lost, he whispers, as if he can't quite believe it yet. Izuku idly scratches his spiky hair. Well, you did win second place, I'm. I'm not the best. I'm not the strongest. He is. Then, slowly, Katsuki's arms begin to tighten around Izuku's waist and he snarls in a deadly low voice, I'm going to kill that fucker. Izuku sweat drops. Ah. How about a friendly rivalry? He suggests weakly. Kaken acts like he doesn't hear him too busy growling obscenities under his breath as he clutches at the back of his Yuku's costume, the freckled boy sighs and continues patting his head soothingly. A couple of minutes later, he hears the door open behind him. Before he can turn to see who it is, Kaken's arms suddenly tighten into a vice grip around him. You. Kaken snarls, the fuck are you doing here, half face. Half face. His Yuku struggles to glance over his shoulder. Totoraki's voice speaks up, I wanted to see, Midraya kun What the fuck for? Kaken spits, you're fine. Totoraki kun Izuku wiggles. Recovery girl did heal me a bit, Totoraki says, but I wanted to talk to Midraya kun before the awards ceremony. Ha? Huh? Talk? Since when do you two talk? Kaken growls, bullshit. You just wanna use his quirk. Well, He's been busting his ass all day, so he's too tired to cack in. Izuku, whines, squirming in his hold. Totoraki approaches and Kaken's grip gets tighter with every step he takes. Let him go, he demands coolly. Don't fucking tell me what to do. I said oh, shut up. Izuku shouts. He pushes his way out of Kaken's arms and stands between the two boys, flustered and rumbled. 
He tucks a few wild curls back into his messed up bun before fixing Kakin with a firm, gaze. Kakin, if Totoraki-kun wants to talk to me about something, then he has the right to do so. But why don't you go change into a new uniform before the ceremony? His suggestion is more of an order. Yours is a mess right now. Kakin scowls. I'm not fucking leaving you here with this little shit. Izuku rolls his eyes. Oh, come on, what's he gonna do? I'm a healer, he knows better, than to mess with me. He giggles to himself and flashes a smile at Totoraki, who is watching their exchange with an unreadable expression. Kakin still looks pissed off. He's gonna do nothing because he's fucking leaving. He whips his head to Totoraki and snarls, Beat it, you two-toned bitch. Kakin. Now as Yuku is starting to get a bit annoyed. He puts a hand on Kakin's bicep, but the blonde shoves him off. Totoraki's eyes narrow. The door opens, once again and recovery girl walks in. Hey, you two. She frowns at Kakin and Totoraki. If you're done harassing my apprentice, you can get your butts back to the arena. The awards ceremony is about to begin. The two boys glare daggers at each other, neither wanting to be the first to move. Izuku scoffs and shoves them both out the door, shutting it behind him and sliding to the floor. I think I'm done with hero students for today, he groans, covering his face with his hands. Recovery girl snorts. Kakin's insufferableness continues on for the rest of the day. Izuku trudges behind his friend as they walk home from school, tired from the long day's events. He glances up at Kakin's back, taking in his hunched shoulders and incessant grumbling, and sighs. Kakin had openly, glared at Totoraki throughout the entire awards ceremony, vehemently refusing the second place medal when All Might presented it to him. The poor number one hero had resorted to hanging it off his gritted teeth while the explosive blonde shrieked at him. It's around his neck now, but that's entirely Izuku's doing. He also refused to leave Izuku's side after the ceremony, insisting on walking him, back to class from the infirmary and snarling at anyone who got too close. He nearly threw a fit every time he caught Totoraki glancing at the greenette. It's a giant step backwards for Kakin's behavior. Izuku hasn't seen this level of aggressive possessiveness from his friend since junior high, but he tries his best not to worry about it. Kakin's had a long, stressful, and ultimately, disappointing day, so Izuku's hoping that he'll go back to normal once he gets over this. And if he doesn't? Well, Izuku's too tired to think about that right now. So maybe it's wrong, but he lets Kakin indulge in his old shitty behavior for now. He sends apologetic smiles to everyone and doesn't complain when Kakin drags him away. Doesn't complain when he stays attached to his hip the entire way home, or when he invites himself in for dinner once they reach Izuku's house. Auntie Mitsuki and Uncle Masaru end up coming over and Inko makes them all a congratulatory dinner. Kakin seethes the entire time and Izuku's too tired to do much talking but he does his best to smile along as his mother recounts her point of view of watching the sports festival. Then Kakan announces that, they're having a sleepover. Except, he doesn't ask his Yuku, more like demands it from the adults, and Inko allows it since they're being given the day off from school tomorrow. So now it's a little past 8pm and his Yuku is curled up in his bed while Kakan lies on the futon on the floor. It's much earlier than his Yuku's usual bedtime, but using his quirk so much has left him exhausted and Kakin always, goes to sleep early anyways. However, it seems that sleep is escaping his best friend right now. He grumbles and snarls to himself, which is Yuku normally might be able to ignore, except they're the only ones in the room so it's all he can hear. He waits 5 minutes, then 10, then 15, but the grumbling doesn't stop. Finally, after 20 minutes, he lets out a loud sigh, Kakin. Can you, please be quiet? Kakin falls silent. Izuku hums and snuggles deeper in his blankets. A moment later, he hears sheets rustling and suddenly the blanket is being yanked off him. Squinting in the low light, he whines in protest as Kakin clambers onto the bed and pushes him aside to make room for himself. Kakin, what are you doing? 
is Yuku makes a disgruntled noise in his throat, one that Kakan entirely ignores. Instead, the blonde flops down next to him with a huff and wraps his arms around him, pulling him to his chest. Izuku blinks in surprise. Kakin has never really been one to initiate cuddling, although Izuku isn't quite sure if this counts as cuddling his grip is way too tight. The smaller boy shifts uncomfortably. He must really be upset then. But it's not the loud, aggressive anger that Izuku is used to seeing from him. Usually Kakin isn't afraid to let everyone around him know that he's pissed off about something and why. This is the quiet type of anger though, the one that stems from a deeper problem, one that he wants to keep to himself. It rarely happens the last time as Yuku can think of is when they had that big fight last year and didn't talk for, almost a month. But why this time? It's just a sports festival. There's a good chance he'll win one of the next two, especially since he has so much time to get stronger. Maybe it's just his pride that's been wounded then. But that doesn't explain why he's all quiet now. Izuku's confusion slowly fades away as he starts to get sleepier and sleepier. Kakin's tight hold is a bit uncomfortable, but, he's warm and he always smells like burnt sugar thanks to his quirk, so Izuku can't help relaxing in his arms as he begins to doze off. Just when he's about to fall asleep, Kakin shifts. His grip tightens ever so slightly. Hot breath brushes against the greenette's curls as he hears his friend whisper quietly, I'm gonna be strong enough for you. I promise. Izuku doesn't have time to process, the words before his mind succumbs to sleep. Chapter 16. BZZZ. 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 Izuku blearily blinks his eyes open, confused when he notices the room is still dark. Something is making the bed vibrate and it takes him a moment to realize that it's coming from his phone underneath his pillow. Sighing, he grabs it and brings it close to his face, grimacing when the bright light from his screen, threatens to blind him. When he's finally able to see who's calling, he's only even more confused. Ida is the one that's calling him. The blue-haired boy had insisted that everyone exchange phone numbers a couple of weeks ago, but he's never called his Yuku before at 11 p.m. no less. They're friends, of course, but they're not exactly close. Izuku's even more surprised to see that he already has two, missed calls from the boy. Worry claws at his heart as he sits up, carefully extracting himself from Kakun's grip, which is much more lax now that the blonde is asleep. Picking up the call, he presses the phone close to his ear and whispers, Ida kun Is everything Almadriya kun Ida shouts, causing Izuku to wince, Midraya kun oh thank god, I apologize deeply fo for calling you so, late, but but he lets out a choked noise and Izuku straightens up in concern. Ida kun He asks, Ida kun what's wrong? Behind him, Kakan lets out an annoyed grumble as he stirs. Izuku barely notices, suddenly a lot more awake than before. He's never heard Ida sound so distraught before. Midraya kun, it apostrophe s dot its. Ida's breath hitches before he wails, it's Nissan. It's my Nissan, the that he got attacked by the hero killer. What? Izuku exclaims, his mind whirling. Kakan sits up and leans against his shoulder, frowning as he listens. Ida kun, what what are you talking about? Ida's response is barely intelligible. He he was on patrol and and he got attacked and I'm in the hospital with him now, but for Riza's brother. Kakan grunts, arching a brow. He's a hero, isn't he? Is Yuku not? Pretty much everyone in the class found out about Ida's family of heroes when Yuraraka couldn't keep her mouth shut about it. So, if it's Ida's brother, then he must be talking about Ingenium. He got attacked by the hero killer? Izuku hasn't been able to keep up with the news that well during the past week, but he's heard that a particular villain has been causing trouble for the heroes lately. Ida kun, Ida kun, Izuku says, trying to keep his voice steady, I need you to calm down. Please, tell me what's going on. Ida gasps for breath. It sounds like he's been crying for a long time. Tensai ni he's, he's paralyzed. His voice shatters when he says this. 
Izuku tenses up and Kakan hisses. That that villain got him and he 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 can't move, his, hero career is over but but. Oh, Midraya-kun, could you heal him? Huh? Me? Izuku startles. You you said you've age healed big injuries. Ida swallows audibly, clearly trying to compose himself. You you regrew a stomach before, did didn't you? Izuku shrinks slightly, anxiety clawing at his chest. I... I don't know, Ida-kun. I've never healed a spine before. Please, please, Midraya-kun. Ida is practically begging now. None of the healers here can do anything for him. If if anyone could heal him, it's you. Izuku's breath catches in his throat. Tears start pricking at the edge of his eyes, but he forces himself to remain calm. Ida-kun. Even if I could heal him, I I'm not allowed to. I'm I'm still in training and I need a license before I'm able to use my quirk on pro heroes. Ida lets out another choked noise of dismay and Izuku hastens to reassure him. But I'll talk to Recovery Girl San in the morning, okay? Maybe we can figure something out, or... Or... I don't know, but we'll fix this, alright? It'll be okay. Okay? Ida inhales shakily and says, Okay. I... Okay, that's... Thank you. And and again I'm sorry for calling you so late don't worry about it, Ida-kun. Izuku says, just stay calm and try to get some sleep. You've had a long day. He doubts Ida will listen to him, but he hangs up soon after anyways. Then, he turns to Kaken, who was silent the entire time. I guess that's why he had to leave the festival early, the blonde muses. Izuku sighs, rubbing his forehead tiredly. The sudden dump of information and emotions is a lot to process when he's, still half asleep. Poor Ida-kun. I mean, paralysis would be horrible for any hero, but ingenium. He's a speedster too, isn't he? Kakan asks and he nods. Who is this hero killer anyway? Kakan flops back down on the bed and after a moment Izuku lies beside him. Haven't you been paying attention to the news? He grumbles. Guy calls himself Stain. Apparently he's killed, like, 17, heroes and injured a bunch of other ones. Izuku's eyes widen. I bet Ingenium was trying to go after him. That's horrible. Izuku murmurs. His friend grunts, yeah, well. You'll call Recovery Girl in the morning. He grabs Izuku again and pulls him close. No point in worrying about it now. Get back to sleep. The freckled boy squirms. Unlike before, he's no longer pressed against his chest. Instead, Kakan is curled around his back, being the perfect, definition of the big spoon. Izuku huffs, you're being awfully cuddly tonight. Shut the fuck up. Despite his fatigue, he doesn't end up sleeping too well during the rest of the night. Kakan snores like a motorboat behind him growling in irritation when Izuku wiggles out of his arms as soon as morning arrives. He quietly steps out of his house before calling Recovery Girl. He quickly, informs her of the situation, but she already knows. She seems annoyed that Ida called him last night and tells him that she's going to go visit Ingenium as soon as she can. But can I? I mean, could I? He starts to ask. His mentor sighs, as if she was expecting this and says, you know you can't. Even if you did have a license, I wouldn't let you heal an injury like that until you got better, control over your quirk. It was very inappropriate for you to come to ask that of you. Izuku feels a flash of defensiveness on behalf of his classmate. He was just upset. I probably would have done the same if I were in his situation. I know, recovery girl says, but still. You have the next two days off enjoy them. Leave this to me for now. Izuku reluctantly agrees and hangs up. After a moment of deliberation, he pulls up his messaging app and texts Ida, apologizing for his inability to help but promising to work hard and get his quirk licensed as soon as possible so he can try to help Tensai. Ida doesn't reply, but it's still early in the morning and the boy has no doubt had a rough night, so Izuku doesn't worry about it. As soon as he pockets his phone, he hears the door open, B. 
behind him. Oi, dumbass, don't come out here all by yourself, Kakan growls. Ignoring the twinge of annoyance his words cause, Izuku says, I was just calling recovery girl San. Didn't want to wake anyone up. Kakan grumbles unintelligibly in response and comes up behind him, hooking his chin over his shoulder as he lets out a drowsy huff. So, what's the deal? Can't do anything without a license, Izuku sighs. Thought so, Kakan hums. Then, after a moment, his arms wrap around Izuku's middle and pull him flush against his chest. Izuku frowns. Apparently Kakan's strange behavior isn't over yet. Not that Izuku's opposed to cuddling, but cuddling is supposed to feel relaxing, and this doesn't feel very relaxing. It feels more like Kakan is trying to keep him from running away, it bothers him a little, but he ignores it in favor of wiggling out of Kakan's grip and going inside to make breakfast. The rest of the morning is rather boring. Izuku is mostly just lounging, trying to regain the rest of his strength back after yesterday's ordeal. He brushes Sushi's fur and watches some TV with Kakan until the blonde suggests playing video games in the afternoon. He's in the middle of a round of Super Smash Brothers when his phone buzzes beside him on the couch. He glances over briefly and Kakan takes advantage of his distraction by punching his Muto off the platform. The blonde snickers while he huffs and grabs his phone. Totoraki 1.15 PM Hello. Izuku blinks in surprise. Totoraki is texting him? Midrayo 1.15 PM Hi. What's up? Kakan complains loudly and he, reluctantly turns back to the game, but curiosity makes it hard to focus and he loses their next match within 2 minutes. At the same time, Totoraki texts back. Totoraki 1.17 PM I visited my mother this morning. Izuku almost drops his phone in shock. That was. Very out of the blue. He isn't quite sure how to respond at first. Midrayo 1.18 PM Oh wow. How did it go? Come on, Zuku. Kakin glares, at his phone. Who the hell are you texting anyways? Izuku waves him off dismissively, watching as the typing bubble appears for a few moments, then disappears. It reappears and disappears a couple of more times before he finally gets a response. Totoraki 1.21 PM Can we meet up somewhere? Midrayo 1.21 PM Now? Totoraki 1.22 PM If you're not busy. Zuku, Kakan gripes, waving his controller, in his face, come on, are we playing or not? Uh, actually, Totoraki-kun wants to meet up so we can chat, Izuku says putting down his controller as he types out his response. A particularly nasty growl from Kakun has him pausing and looking up. The blonde looks pissed. Since when are you two fucking friends? Since. Izuku trails off, suddenly nervous. I don't know. Since we're never. He, and Totoraki never really hung out before the sports festival, which Kakun knows since he spends so much time with Izuku. So the fact that they want to hang out now probably looks suspicious. Kakin huffily turns back to the TV. Well, tell him you're fucking resting or some shit. Izuku frowns. But I want to go see him. Why? Two. Two, you know. Talk. He throws his hands up in the air, you can talk over the phone, Kakin says dismissively and unpauses the game, you should be Samus next. I'm not playing anymore, Kakin. The spark of indignation returns. He pushes his controller aside and gets off the couch. I'm going to go hang out with Totoraki-kun. Suddenly, a hand snatches his wrist in a vice grip. No, you're fucking not. Kakan snaps, jumping to his feet. Izuku, tenses up as soon as he grabs him. His training kicks in and he twists out of the other's grip, stumbling back a few steps and turning to fully face him. Kakan glares at him with crimson eyes, muscles tense and hackles raised, looking as if he's one second away from pouncing. Kakan, Izuku says warningly, are you not letting me leave? Yes yeah, sir, no Kakan cuts himself off, then lets out a frustrated noise, just fuck it, I'm coming with you then. He takes a step towards him but Izuku steps back. 
I don't want you to come with me. Why not? The blonde snaps, reaching for him again. Because a hand closes around his forearm again. Izuku tries to twist away again, but Kakin doesn't release his grip, instead moving closer and grabbing his other wrist too. Let me go, Kakin. Why don't you want me coming with you? Kakin demands, stepping even closer and crowding his space as Izuku continues to struggle against him. Because you'll just freaking argue with him all the time. Izuku snaps, then shoves the other boy with his shoulder, let me go. Kakin pushes right back. No. Izuku tries to wrench his wrists out of his grip and the blonde bears his teeth in a snarl. You little fucking stop let me go. Izuku snaps again, then yelps when Kakin suddenly yanks him so close their chests nearly collide. But as soon as he's pulled closer, he's shoved back again by Kakin's shoulder, only this time the boy's foot is hooked around the back of his ankle. Izuku squeaks when he loses his balance and Kakin uses his grip on his wrists to twist him to the side, forcing him back down onto the couch. The blonde pounces on top of him, attempting to pin him to the cushion, and Izuku's heart leaps to his throat in panic. Kakin. He cries out, thrashing in his grip. Kakin's fingers tighten painfully around his wrists, his crimson eyes narrowed to pinpricks and furry. Stop it. He snarls trying to force him onto his back while the smaller boy, struggles against him, stop fucking squirming. For all of Kakin's aggressiveness, he's hardly ever truly rough with Izuku, so maybe that's why a stab of fear goes through him now. And the next thing he knows, they're wrestling. Except it isn't playful or even for training Kakin is really angry and Izuku has no idea why. He tries to push him off, to give himself space so he can scramble away, but the angle is bad and Katsuki is a lot stronger than him. He forces his arms back down with a snarl and pins his wrists on either side of his head. Izuku kicks his leg out and attempts to flip him with a jerk of his hips, but Katsuki is stubborn and jams his knee into his hip a couple of times in retaliation until he stops trying to flip him, then presses his knees down on either side of his thighs to keep him from moving. Izuku squirms breathlessly but Kakin is heavy weight on top of him, impossible to move. Finally, he falls still, breathing heavily as he glares up at Kakin above him. The blonde stares at him with wild eyes, panting slightly. Then, in a low voice, he says, I'm not letting you go alone. You need protection. Protection? Izuku exclaims in disbelief, that's, what you're worried about. He rolls his eyes scoffing in exasperation. Just Kakin being overprotective as always. Geez, don't worry, I'll be safe. I'll be with Totoraki-kun. He means to appease his friend, but if anything, he only makes him even angrier. The grip on his wrists tightens painfully. Why the fuck would you rather hang out with that icy hot fucker than me? Kakin snarls at his face. What's he got that I don't? Is it cause he beat me in every fucking game? Is it cause of that shiny new first place medal? Huh? Kakin. Izuku's eyes widen in shock. Well, fuck him. Kakin shrieks, I don't give a shit that he won this time. And I don't give a shit that he won on the first day either or that he's a recommendation student, or that he's the son of the number two, hero, cause I'm gonna be number one. I'm gonna be the strongest fucking hero there is and I'll wipe the floor with his ass. Izuku gulps as those wild eyes glare heatedly down at him. And I'll kill any villain that tries to lay a hand on you. So if you think that you'll ever be safer with that fucker than with me, you're dead wrong. I'm gonna be better than that piece of shit, just you wait. His chest heaves as he pants heavily after his rant. Izuku stares up at him, stunned. Silence fills the room. The memory of Kakin's voice whispers in the back of his mind, I'm gonna be strong enough for you. I promise. Izuku blinks. Oh. He's. He's. Kakin, he says quietly, you. You know you're enough, right? Kakin scowls. The fuck do you mean? I mean. He tries to wiggle his wrists, but Kakin won't let him go, his grip, instead tightening even further. 
is Yuku hesitates. I mean. You're good enough. For me. He presses his lips together and gazes up at his friend. Do you? Do you really think that I would prefer Totoraki kun over you because you lost? He can't keep the hurt out of his voice. How could Kakin think so little of him? The blonde is quiet for a few moments, jaw clenched. Then, it would make sense. I, lost to him. I keep losing to him. He's, he's stronger than me. He bites out the words as if they're physically painful to say and, knowing Kakin, they probably are. His throat bobs as he swallows. He'd be a better hero for you. He'd keep you safe. You keep me safe, is Yuku insists, but Kakin just scoffs. Not well enough to keep you from getting attacked by a bunch of fucking reporters. Or, to keep you from nearly getting kidnapped and sold for your quirk. His voice quivers ever so slightly and he squeezes his eyes shut. Fuck, I couldn't even keep you safe from me. I just keep failing Kakin, stop it, is Yuku protests, you're fine, you're perfect? Trust me, I would get into a lot more trouble if I didn't have you around. He gives him a solemn look. We're still learning. Remember? Don't you remember what I said back during our first hero lesson? You're going to fail and that's alright, that's part of life, and I won't think any less of you for doing so. It just means you're going to grow even stronger from then on. Katsuki doesn't look convinced. I see hot Totoraki kun is going to fail too, is Yuku interrupts, deciding to ignore the rude nickname for now. I know it may not seem like it right now, but he will eventually. He's a 15 year old boy just like the rest of us, and he came to I to learn, just like the rest of us too. You can't learn without making some mistakes along the way. Katsuki opens his mouth to say something, then closes it, mouth pressed into a line of displeasure. His expression is still tense, but his jaw looks less tight, than before. Izuku takes it as his cue to continue, and you shouldn't compare yourself to him like that. Yeah, he's really strong, and he might be stronger than you now, but you're plenty strong too, and I know you're going to get stronger than ever now that we're in a he rolls his eyes and playfully cocks his head to the side. You're the most bullheaded, stubborn person I know, Kakin. If, you said you're going to beat Totoraki-kun, chances are, it's gonna happen sooner or later. Kakin huffs, and his grip on Izuku's wrists finally eases up slightly. Izuku slips out of his grasp and slides his hands up his arms comfortingly. He can feel the power and strength in his friend's hard muscles along with all this stress and tension as well. His lips press together. And, he adds in a, gentler voice, because he knows how important being his protector is to Kakin, I know you think you are the only thing standing between me and villains, but you're not. We're in the, surrounded by some of the best heroes in the country. We have All Might as our teacher. He smiles, letting a little awe seep into his voice before he sobers up again. And we have friends now, Strong friends that, are going to be great heroes too. You should trust in their ability to keep me safe. I do. Kakin wrinkles his nose, then glances away with a low growl. I still don't like that icy hot fucker. Izuku gives him a deadpanned look. Well, sorry, but I'm allowed to hang out with people other than you. And just because I want to spend time with Totoraki-kun today doesn't mean that I suddenly hate you or think that you're inferior or whatever you were implying. I'm not hanging out with him because I think he's better than you, I'm hanging out with him because I like making new friends. Kakin scowls. Izuku decides to take a little pity on him. But you'll always be my best friend. He smiles brightly. Kakin squints and grumbles under his breath before begrudgingly leaning back with a huff, fucking whatever, then, he grunts as he gets off him shoving his hands into his pockets, just one condition. He's got to come pick you up. I don't want you walking alone. Izuku rolls his eyes and sits up, relieved to be free of Kakin's suffocating weight. Yes, your highness, he says sarcastically, turning to search for his phone. Unsurprisingly, it had fallen to the floor during their scuffle, and he sighs in relief when he sees it's undamaged. 
Midrayo 1.34 p.m. Sorry for the late response, but yeah I'm down to hang out now. Do you mind picking me up at my place? Kakin's been an overprotective but and doesn't want me going by myself. Totoraki 1.35 p.m. Sure? What's your address? Izuku texts it to him, and then, after a moment, texts his mother as well, letting her know that. He's going out. He's glad that she had to leave earlier to take sushi to the vet, otherwise they both would have been witness to his little argument with Kakin. As he types, he calls out, Hey, why don't you hang out with Kirishima Kun while I'm gone? You like him, don't you? Kakin wrinkles his nose. I don't fucking like anyone. A pause, then, and who the fuck is Kirishima? Izuku looks up, are you kidding me? We hang out with him every day. The blonde frowns, as if it's actually taking a lot of work to remember. Then, he blinks. Oh. You mean shitty hair. Oh my god, Kakin, you are hopeless. He pulls up another chat. Midrayo 1.40 pm Hey, could you do me a huge favor? Kirishima 1.41 pm Anything bro. Midrayo 1.42 pm Can you invite Kakin out somewhere? I wanna hang out with. Totoraki Kun and Kakin's been annoying about it. Kirishima 1.43 pm sure thing. Totoraki arrives at his house 20 minutes later. It's strange to see him in civilian clothes, but even stranger to see him without the usual cold look in his eyes. He greets Izuku with a faint smile and doesn't even seem to mind when Kakin outright growls at him, demanding that he bring Izuku back in one piece. The blonde then proceeds to glare at him the entire time as they leave. Sorry about Kakin, Izuku apologizes as he walks beside Totoraki. He's been a bit grumpy ever since the sports festival. Totoraki nods, then glances over his shoulder before looking back at him. I'm a bit confused. I know that you guys walk to school together, but does he live with you too? Oh, no, that's not it. Izuku, waves his hands. We just live on the same street, so he comes over often. Ah, Totoraki hums. There's a brief pause, then he adds, he seems to be very protective of you. Izuku winces, recalling how Kakan had practically snarled at anyone, Totoraki especially, who got too close to him after the sports festival. Heck, he didn't even allow him to heal the rest of Totoraki's injuries. Yeah, he says, he has his reasons, though. How are you feeling today, by the way? He eyes the large bandage on the boy's cheek. I'm fine. Totoraki looks at him. What are his reasons? Huh? His reasons, the other boy repeats, for being so protective. Forgive me for being rude, but I don't think I'm the only one who's noticed the way he treats you. He acts like he's constantly, expecting someone to snatch you away from him. Like you can't defend yourself. He glances away. I thought our sparring match proved to everyone that you can certainly put up a good fight, despite being a healer. Izuku pauses, considering his answer. Well. We've been friends basically since we were babies. Kakin's always been really strong. Especially after he got his quirk, and when mine, manifested. I guess it kind of just made sense for him to protect me. Healing quirks are pretty rare and they're sought after by both heroes and villains. Totoraki nods, as if this is something he's already aware of, and Izuku assumes that he must know about the incident with his father's healer. Still, he hesitates to continue. Totoraki has already told him incredibly personal things about him. It's only fair that he reciprocates. But. I guess it only got really bad after. Well, there was this one time I almost got kidnapped by villains. Totoraki's eyes widened slightly. I was hanging out with Kakin and some friends, and the villains lured me into an empty alley and put me in a bag. He trails off, curling into himself slightly at the fear the memory brings. Er, they wanted to sell, me for my quirk, but Aizawa Sensei saved me. And ever since then, Kakin's just been super paranoid about me being taken again. And that paranoia kind of bleeds into our school life. So I'm sorry that he's a bit aggressive towards people sometimes, but it's not coming from a mean place, I promise. 
He looks at Totoraki earnestly and the other boy nods. He's quiet for a moment, then hums, thoughtfully. I guess I've misjudged him, then. Izuku smiles, then huffs a little laugh, this is actually kind of weird for me. Hanging out with you. I hardly ever go anywhere without Kaken. This is. Kind of weird for me too, Totoraki agrees, I don't really ever. Hang out. With people. He looks so unsure and awkward that Izuku can't help but smile even wider. He gets the feeling that, Totoraki isn't really cold so much as socially inept. I do wish he would trust me a bit more, though, he says conversationally, I mean, I like to think that I'm a decent fighter. You are, Totoraki says. Not good enough to beat you, though, Izuku points out. Yeah, well. Totoraki shrugs. You've said you've been taking self-defense classes since you were 10, didn't you? Izuku nods. Surprised that he remembered that. I've been training, my entire life to be a pro hero, so it's not fair to compare yourself to me. Not many people would win against me. Izuku's lip twitches and he's tempted to make a sarcastic comment about how humble Totoraki is. But the boy doesn't sound like he's trying to brag. More like he's simply stating a fact. Izuku is silent for a moment, then shakes his head. Well, anyway, enough about me. What about, you? You wanted to talk about your mother, didn't you? He realizes that, thanks to Kaken, he hasn't been able to properly talk to Totoraki since he convinced him to use his fire. Which is a huge deal that he's definitely going to ask about later, but one thing at a time. They've been walking for the past few minutes, so now they're just approaching a neighborhood park. Totoraki wordlessly leads him over to a bench and sits down beside him. It went. Better than I thought it would, he says quietly, I. After the sports festival, I was still unsure about using my fire. My old man approached me afterwards and told me how proud he was that I had gotten over my childish tantrum. He sneers somewhat and frowns at the ground. It made me sick. But I realized that, when I used my fire during, the battle, I didn't think about him at all. All I could think about was why he suddenly cuts himself off, pressing his lips together. Izuku tilts his head curiously, but he can't see the expression on the other boy's face since he turns it away slightly. After a moment, Totoraki clears his throat and continues, so I thought I'd visit my mother at the hospital this morning. I never visited her, before because I figured that my presence would put pressure on her but I may have just been making excuses for myself. I thought. If I could just see her. Talk to her. Maybe try and fix things. Then maybe it would be okay for me to be the hero I want to become. Izuku watches him quietly. He doesn't exactly know what that means, what kind of hero Totoraki wants to be, but the other boy seems to, know exactly what he wants to aim for, so that's all that matters. And? He prompts gently. Totoraki smiles softly and looks at him. She forgave me. She was even. Happy to see me. I told her everything and she apologized for burning me and told me to move forward in my life without anything holding me back. That that would be her salvation. Izuku beams at him, hard warming his chest. So. So, I will no longer let my father hold me back, Totoraki says resolutely, I won't let him control me and I won't become someone as bitter and angry as him. That's wonderful, Totoraki-kun, he says, I'm so happy for you. Totoraki gazes at him. I would never have been able to do it if it hadn't been for you. Izuku blushes and starts to stammer out a protest, but Totoraki insists, no, really, if you hadn't said what you did, if you hadn't opened my eyes, nothing would have changed. I'd still be trapped by my father, so seriously, Midraya-kun, thank you. He looks so earnest it makes Izuku's heart jump. Still blushing furiously, he hides his face in his arms and squeaks, you're welcome. Totoraki tilts his head, blinking curiously. Are you okay? Your face is red. I'm fine. If, you're not feeling well, then we can I said I'm fine. Izuku frantically tries to change the subject. 
So so what are you going to do now? Er, I'm assuming you you need to train your fire. I mean, since you didn't use it for so long. Totoraki pauses and then nods. They talk about school for a bit after that, about how Totoraki might train his fire quirk and how Izuku is currently training his own quirk. Izuku finds that talking with Totoraki is a lot different than talking with Kaken, who usually leads the conversation. Not to say that he doesn't ever listen to Izuku, but the Gurinet is finding that Totoraki is more than happy to sit back and let him talk enough for the both of them, occasionally commenting or giving his input here and there. It's different, but nice. Izuku regrets, not having befriended him sooner, although he supposes that Totoraki has changed a lot since the first week of school. The conversation eventually turns to Ingenium when Izuku's phone lights up with a notification of a news story reporting his near-fatal encounter with the hero killer. He admits to Totoraki about Ida calling him the previous night, expressing his worry over their vice class, President. Totoraki seems rather disturbed too, although he doesn't show it very much. You're friends with Ida-kun, aren't you? Oh, uh, sort of. We're friendly with each other, but we don't really hang out much, Izuku says, didn't you team up with him during the cavalry battle? Totoraki nods. Yeah. He seems passionate. I just hope he doesn't turn it against that hero killer. Izuku, frowns. What do you mean? Well, he probably holds a lot of resentment towards him, Totoraki points out, for effectively ending his brother's hero career. Izuku winces. Do you think he'll, I don't know, do something? Totoraki shrugs cluelessly. I'm not sure. I don't know him well enough. I just know that anger can make you do stupid things. His tone is all too knowing. 